Genesis chapter 6, please. I get a little nervous about preaching this tonight, and uh, it's not because of the controversialness of the passage, but we are going to look at an extremely controversial passage, and I, I like that piece of it uh, because I'm confident with what the Word of God teaches and, and searching the matter out. Confidence and arrogance are not the same thing, right? Amen? I can't stand an arrogant guy. I mean, nothing irritates me more than an arrogant guy. See, an arrogant guy, I want to fight him. An arrogant woman just is kind of nauseating. You just ignore her and just whatever, you know. But an arrogant guy just irritates me. But a confident man who's got humility, I appreciate that. Don't you? Amen. I'm confident, not in myself. I'm confident in the words of God. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to let the Bible speak for itself. I'm going to show you both sides of the argument just to be fair and to give you an opportunity to figure out what you personally believe about this passage of Scripture. If you disagree with me, that's okay. I'm still your friend, and I'm still your pastor, and I can still love you even if you're wrong. Amen. Amen. Um, but listen, it's not what we're going to look at is not anything that has to do with the, the faith, It's not anything that a Christian ought to split with another Christian over. It's not anything that ought to affect our fellowship. Amen. I'm told to love you and to be charitable towards you. But what we are going to look at is some deep doctrine. I mean, what you're getting into tonight is is a T-bone steak. It's meat. And I'm going to do my best to grind it down real good and make sure it's digestible before I give it to you. But for everybody in here... Even for me, I I, I have studied this even for me. That sounds horrible. What I mean by this, that is, I've believed what I'm going to show you for a long time. This is not a new thing to me. And I've studied it, and I've digested it, and I've looked at it from multiple angles, and even yet, this doctrine still has mysteries around it. There's still even more things that I'm studying and learning that I'm not even going to share with you tonight because I don't have them nailed down well enough yet. And frankly, we're getting in over our heads. Okay? Um, So I'm just going to try to keep it on the surface. I get nervous about preaching this kind of stuff because uh, here's why. (laughs) Because I have a real enemy. You might walk up all arrogantly and be like, well, why would you be nervous? What's the problem? Well, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is if you have that attitude, you don't know what you're messing with yet. And, And I've learned the hard way what I'm dealing with. I know what I'm up against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, and it's not a joke. So I don't arrogantly rush into teaching on the devil. I don't arrogantly rush into teaching on angels or demons or any of that kind of stuff. I don't like even talking about it. But now we're in a passage of Scripture in the Word of God that has to deal with it, and we've got to deal with it. So I'm going to show you, as humbly as I know how, by the grace of God, I'm going to show you what I believe and what the Bible teaches. But I don't want to get an arrogant attitude about this stuff. When you start focusing on it and getting into it and studying it, and and there's something about, I'm I'm giving you a warning, I'm not even preaching yet. There's something about this kind of stuff that intrigues you and me. And if you don't think it intrigues us, look at the movies on TV that are so popular. If it doesn't intrigue the human nature and the flesh, then why is it that all this demon stuff and and alien stuff, and vampire stuff, and this this crossbreeding between humans and extraterrestrials and all. Why is that so popular on TV and in the movies? Because there's something about your wicked and dirty and sinful heart that likes it. Amen. I've seen churches get wrecked because some people fall in love with this stuff and start making it the theme of their life and ministry. And even if they're not called to preach, they'll make it the theme of their fellowship. They'll start finding these DVDs and all this YouTube stuff, and they'll go around looking at this stuff and studying this stuff and reading this stuff, and they're getting into the Illuminati and the Masons and, and demons and demonic spin. They just get all wrapped up in this junk, and the devil always wins when you give him your mind and your heart on that level. You don't have a chance, and neither does your preacher, and neither does this church. So this is not going to become the theme of our ministry or the theme of our church. No matter how much you enjoy the teaching, remember that that just might not be the Spirit of God. It might be your flesh that enjoys it. Are we all duly warned and scared now? (laughs) Let's get into the Word of God. Amen. 
Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight, and we're so thankful for how good you've been to us. Lord, I'm thankful that you brought me and my family back here to our home church, Lord, safely. And uh, Father, it's a blessing to have a church family. It's a blessing to have a church home. And I praise you and I thank you for starting one here and for building one here. And Father, I know who's done the work. I know who it is that has made this thing happen. And I know, Father, that it's not me or in me. Actually, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So anything good that's happened in my life so far, anything good that's happened in the almost six years of this ministry is all because of Jesus Christ, my Savior, my guide, my King, my friend, and I thank you, and I love you, I look to you, Lord, I know how the adversary has worked in and through my life, I know throughout my life, I know what he's done, I know how powerful our enemy is, and Father, I also believe that I'm uh, real sure here what the scriptures teach, but I pray that you'd help us tonight to, to have our eyes open, some may not see it. But I pray that all would be duly warned and that we would walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, that we would look to Jesus Christ, that we would trust our Savior, that, Father, the teaching of the Word of God tonight would not only open our eyes to the truths of God's Word and to the reality of the battle we're in, but that it would also, Father, draw us closer to Jesus Christ as a church. And, Father, I right now, with, with the blessing of God, as much as is possible, Lord, I ask you, to rebuke that spirit, that attitude among Christians that can become so obsessed with this kind of stuff that, Lord, they get all off balance and messed up and they turn aside from the simplicity of the gospel. They turn aside from the beauty, purity, and simplicity that is and that's in Christ and start getting wrapped up in the study of this stuff. Father, I pray you'd protect them. The young men in this church that love the Word of God, that want to learn it, that are trying to learn it, that are growing in it. God, I pray you'd protect them from the pride of the flesh and, and Lord, the pride of the mind that seeks to get infatuated with this stuff. Help them to study the Word of God for what it is and, Lord, to learn what they learn from the Word of God and not start going off into other routes and other avenues and other books and teachings of men and preachings of preachers that aren't right. I pray, Father, you'd protect us as a church. It's what I'm asking. And see us through, Father. And I pray that tonight when we leave here, we would know that we would met with the Lord, that we would know that we were in the word of God, that we would know, Father, that the people would know that they heard from a preacher who is God's man. Father, I know that even my understanding and my, even if my heart is right and I'm trying to do the best that I can, that I can be deceived and I realize that. So, Lord, we look to the word of God, which is true. And we ask you to help the word of God to saturate me and to saturate this place tonight. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, first of all, you'll notice in verse number 1, the Bible says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Just stop for a second, if you would, and let's think about this. And let's actually look at the Bible and figure out what God means when He says men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Uh, everybody's talking about nowadays about the population crisis, you know, and they're all panicking about the population. They're saying the population of the world by 2050 is going to be over 9 billion. And there's just a big problem here, our carbon footprint and blah, 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 all the idiots who think that they're smart, uh, you know, they, they think that they got a high IQ and really they don't. 
Uh, they think noodles are ramen and not for swimming. Amen? He gave me a thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> they, they think they're real smart, you know. And, and, and they're actually stupid idiots. They're all worried about the multiplication. Brother, that wasn't you. I wasn't, <laughs> okay, we're cool, all right. <laughs> you said amen when I said stupid idiots. <laughs> so they think they're so smart and they're all worried about it, but actually God's built this planet to sustain life. God's actually built this planet to rebuild itself, just like he's done with your body. When you cut yourself, it heals. Amen? Uh, God's amazing, and I don't think we have to worry about multiplying so much that we wipe out the planet and the natural resources and all that stuff. I'm not going to keep going down this road, but just think about it. We have got so many natural resources that are untapped, it's not even funny. So just don't buy into all that stupidity. Actually, let's take a look and just think for a second about how many people were actually on the planet. First of all, let me say this. This is all going to be surmising, but it's not evil. It's just surmising. Because God doesn't give us an exact population number, so we don't know for sure. But think about this for a second. Men are living 900 plus years. And they're starting to have children. Back in chapter 4, the earliest age they started having children at was 65. 65 years old, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 21. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. So Enoch lives 65 years and has his first child according to the text. But he continues to have children for many years to come. He says there in verse 21, he lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. Enoch walked with God and begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters after he begat Methuselah. He still begat sons and daughters. So he had multiple children. Look at verse number uh, 4. The days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. So he's telling us that throughout his life he continued to begat children. Look at verse 7. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. Look at verse 10. Uh, I just showed you that one. Look at verse 13. And Canaan lived after he got Mahaliel 840 years and begat sons and daughters. Could you think with me for a second how many people these guys had? How many children these people had? You know, the average, just the average fertility period of life nowadays for a woman is about 20 years, give or take. Some it's a little more. But the average fertility is 20 years of life. And a big family nowadays is four or five kids. I mean, that's considered huge. Who is this, the Duggars or something? How many they got now? Nineteen. That just makes my head spin. Makes me feel sick to my stomach. Nineteen, and that's like a weird thing, but that's happening now. Could you imagine these people that are living 900 years having sons and daughters for hundreds of years? Folks, you can't do the math. It'd be insane. In the last, listen to this, the most conservative, most conservative estimate I heard one preacher say was a billion people. I think he was way short. I mean, way short. If they're living now, they've been at it about 14, uh, 15, 1,400 years since creation. But here we are, 4,600 years later, right now, 4,600 years since the text, there's 7 billion people on the planet. So they had 1,600 years. For, excuse me. 1,400 years of living 900 years and having children. We've had 4,600 years of a short lifespan. Hold on a minute. Wars, famines, droughts, cancers, abortions, murders, and the list goes on and on, not to mention death by natural causes, death by accident, which is keeping the population numbers down and the short lifespan, and all the health problems that we have nowadays that are escalating. They're not getting better even with modern science. They're escalating because man's messing with God's food and creating GMOs and on chemicals to stop the bugs and all the stuff that they're trying to do to get richer and to make more money. 
So the health problems are escalating. They're not getting better. They're getting worse. There are women dying in childbirth. This stuff wasn't happening at the same rate in the period we're looking at right now. These people are living a long lifespan because the environment, the atmosphere they were in was a better atmosphere. They were breathing cleaner air. They were eating better fruit and a cleaner ground. They didn't have this many years, 6,000 years of living in a sin-cursed world for things to continue to de-evolve. Evolution is not true. Back here, their health was much better. The environment was much better. And they're having children like crazy. The population, we got no idea how many were here. Lots of people on this planet. And God said this, I'm tired of them. He said, I'm tired of them. Came to pass when they began to multiply on the earth. Daughters were born unto them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. You know what God's problem with man was? His problem with man was his flesh. You know what the problem with men today is? It's still their flesh. You know what your problem this evening is? It's your flesh. You might think you're spiritual. You might think you're gaining ground. You might even be growing spiritually. You might actually be doing better today than you've ever done before. You very likely may be at a point right now where some of your sin problems actually just kind of smell bad to you. Some of the things you used to do, you say, oh, it makes me sick to my stomach to think about going back there. I never want to return. I never want to go back to my sin. Let me warn you about your flesh. I don't care how holy you think you are, by the end of tonight, before you lay your head down on your pillow, anything you've done in the past, you could do again. I'm talking up to myself, folks, not just you. Before I make it home under the right circumstances with the right pressure and the right temptation, I could be drunk before I made it home. And I think to myself, my goodness, man, I mean, I was talking to somebody this last weekend who's messed up and he's struggling, and I was almost begging the guy to knock it off. He's saved. He's backslidden. Just trying to encourage him. Man, don't ever go back there. Knock it off. What's, there's nothing back there. I have no desire to go back. I'm so happy to serve the Lord. I'm so excited about being a Christian. I'm so excited about doing right. I don't want the things of the world. I tell you that truthfully. I don't want them. I don't want to go back. I'm excited about God. I'm excited about the ministry. If you didn't have an exciting weekend, that is your problem. I had a riot. I was hung over on Tuesday and not from alcohol. Amen. I better repeat that because this is on the internet, not from alcohol, not from drugs. I was hung over from stress and lack of sleep, amen? I was walking around, man, feeling like, my goodness, my wife and I both Tuesday were looking at each other like, happy birthday. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> I mean, it felt horrible, man. It was an exciting, it was an adventuresome weekend. It was exciting. I'm enjoying serving the Lord. I wouldn't want to do that again, but I'm enjoying serving the Lord. That's my point. But you want to know something about my flesh? It's wicked. It's just wicked. Before I make it home tonight, I could mess up in ways I never imagined I would possibly ever mess up in my life. And the same is true about you. And God got tired of them. Romans chapter 7 tells us that our flesh has no good in it. Don't turn there for the sake of time. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's what the Apostle Paul said. So before you put on the Christian strut and start walking around here like you're something special, I feel I wasn't planning on preaching tonight. I'm planning on teaching. Stay calm so I can think. But I, I'm feeling a preaching coming on. Boy, I hate that stuff. Before you start walking around here like you're Joe Spiritual, like you got it together, you know it all, you, go, you know the Bible. Before you start acting like that, you better remember that your flesh stinks. And although you might think a lot of yourself, the rest of us can look at you and see how bad you stink. Amen. That flesh is rotten and don't trust it. I don't trust my own. You think I'm going to trust yours? God said, my spirit's not always going to strive with man. Why? Because he's flesh. God could have said because he's filthy. God could have said because he's wicked. God could have said a lot of things. But the first thing God said is because he's flesh. You live in a culture that's infatuated with flesh. You're all about flesh. 
You know, in researching the, the dogs, that we're trying to look to find a dog, and researching the dogs, you know what we figured out? Actually, the big German shepherds, you know, the over 100 pounds, that's not even really good. They're Americanized. And they have problems like hip dysplasia and all kinds of stuff because the Americans are so obsessed with having a big, bad dog of my dog, man, that they mess them up, and they mess up a great bloodline and a phenomenal dog because we're obsessed with flesh. You don't think so? Walk in the gym and look around. Gyms nowadays are more like a bar than they are a gym. I found one gym I could go to every once in a blue moon. I haven't been in months because it's mostly old people, and they know they're dying anyhow. And I sit there and I laugh at them because they still squeeze themselves into the little funny pants, and they you know, walk on you like, Ew, oh, my goodness, Lord, help me. I mean, I'm scarred now. <laughs> and we're obsessed with it, folks. You know, surgeries for this. I want to get my nose. My kid's such an ugly nose. You know, watch these women on TV. You think are pretty. Look at them close. They're freaks, man. I'm like, wow, that was definitely a lip job gone bad. I mean, look at that. <laughs> and because they put paint on them and stuff, people think, oh, she's so beautiful. God doesn't care about flesh. Amen. God hates it, actually. He's going to give you a glorified body just to show you what you should have. Man has a wicked heart. God said this. God saw, verse 5, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his what? Heart was only, follow your heart. Don't do it. (laughs) I'm just following my heart. Don't do it. Don't follow your heart. Your heart's wicked. Your heart's ungodly. Oh, he just, I meant it for good. I mean well. No, you don't mean well. You got yourself deceived into thinking you mean well. And your wicked heart is evil and ungodly and it's vile and it's filthy. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is wicked. You got that? Give your heart to Jesus Christ. That's the only good thing that can come out of it. Amen. At a point in my marriage where if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we wouldn't love each other. And it's not because I'm falling out of love with her. That's for sure. I'm more in love with her than I've ever been, honestly. Don't read into that. But we both realize at this point that if it's not for Jesus Christ, there's no way. She told me the other day, she said, you're nothing like you were when I married you. And she didn't say it. You're nothing like you were when I married you. She said it the other way, honestly. But I said, we both talked about it. I said, you know what, though? If it's not for the Lord, we don't have a chance. And we both know it. I got a great marriage. I really do. We fight. We fight just because we like making up. Amen. You'll get that later. We're married. We're allowed. Okay? It's all right. You can smile. Relax. You know what? We need the Lord. You know why? I love her. I love her. fell in love with her when I first saw her. But you know what I realize right now? Listen to me for a minute. You know what I realize right now? It was not her that I loved. It was me. I'm in love. No, you're not. You're in love with yourself. You're in love with what you think that person can do for you. You ever think about that for a minute? Just stop and think about that for a minute. It takes some years to really love somebody. So you know what you better do and that other person better do? You both better love the Lord and make your decision based on God and doctrine and truth and direction and where you're going in life the right way. I'm not saying don't romantically fall in love. That's fine. That's good. But that's not the focus because your heart's wicked. You know what men are, ladies? They're dogs. Men are dogs. They will love you for what you can do for them. That's it. And then they'll dump you at the side of the road. And nowadays, fellas, the women aren't any better. I'm not even getting to the message yet. I think we're going to have a two-week series here coming on. Flesh is wicked. The heart is wicked. The thoughts of the heart are evil continually. God's fed up with it. Man even has an evil mind. And I got some verses there to run to, but I'm not going to tonight for the sake of time. The Bible says that evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, and that men are inventors of evil things. There is no limit to what a man can invent. How many of you got an apple tonight? I got one up here. Look, 
I preach out of something that's got the symbol on the back of it. Hey, you know what that thing is? Uh, that, th- these guys can invent all kinds of stuff to get your money. It's, it's scary what these things can do, isn't it? You ever think about how that works? Little things inside of there that are connecting to airwaves that are sending messages? <laughs> Wild, man. Now give a guy 900 years in a perfect environment, drinking pure water, eating pure food. Give him 900 years. And then give him a kid to train that's going to outlive him. And another one to train. And the best and brightest minds. Our IQs today are probably nowhere in the ballpark of the IQ that these people had. Nowhere in the ballpark. And give them hundreds of years to live and pass on their knowledge to each other and team together, and the best and the brightest from every area getting together. God ended it, right, and shortened the lifespan, and shortly after that, in the Tower of Babel, God said, we better stop them, confound the language because of what they were doing. You realize how many evil things are invented now? Evil, man. Your thoughts, your imaginations, your heart, your mind. You know what the Bible tells us? But we have the mind of Christ. You don't know how much that relieves the pressure I feel. Because my mind can cook up so many things. How many times have you seen me in six years say, this is what the Lord wants us to do. Let's go get her done, right? And the Lord wasn't in it at all. You know, you know I, I've started to slow down. If you haven't noticed, I've started to slow down a little bit and just kind of feel things out. Because I want to make sure it's truly the mind of God instead of me getting myself and our church into another mess. <laughs> God's been good, but it's the mind of Christ that's going to get us where we need to be. You know what you need in your marriage? You need the mind of Christ. You know what you need in your child rearing? You need the mind of Christ. You know what you need on your job? The mind of Christ. In your Bible, the mind of Christ. You know what you got? A filthy mind. You've never lived in a generation of filthier minds. I'd be willing to put money on it. I mean money on like a lot of money on it. If I had it, I'd put it on it. <laughs> I'd be willing to put my house up. That there aren't some people in this room right now that got a major problem with their mind. Major. Now, I'm not here to beat you up because you're not alone. All right? Don't be like, oh, I'm going to quit on God. I'm... No, don't quit. That's not the answer. But it is more common than ever before. On TV, on the internet, on the billboard signs, walk through to the Times Square at night. It's a, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, I imagine, to have a pure mind than it was 100 years ago. I, I can give you that. But there's no excuse for it. It angers God. Clean your mind up. Clean your mind up. You men ought to be able to look at a woman without thinking filthy thoughts about her. You can't look at a woman without thinking the wrong things. There's something stinking wrong with you. Your mind's filthy. You need the mind of Christ. Oh, by the way, ladies, before you hoot and holler, you ain't no better nowadays, even Christian women. Amen? Let's be honest. Put the shoe on the other foot. The women nowadays have become just, and thank God, I hope Christian women aren't as bad, but I wouldn't be surprised a bit. Clean it up. It makes God angry. Now, I know this isn't popular, right? I'm not even preaching, am I? I'm not stomping, I'm not shouting, I'm not spitting. This isn't popular stuff, but it's still Bible. I want a clean church. Men become so filthy and so ungodly that God gets to a point here where he's going to wipe them out. And you know what you got going on in churches today? And I'll be careful because we're in mixed company. But uh, this open marriage stuff. You'll see young couples around churches. And I, I don't want to go so far the other way that we can't fellowship and say, hey, how you doing, sister? It's good to see you. You know, hi, have a nice day. Oh, that was funny. You know, relax, all right? On one hand, let's, let's, we're family. You're my sister. If you're saved and you're here tonight, you're my sister in Christ. So if I say, hi, how are you? That doesn't mean anything, all right? Don't be sick. That's one hand. On the other hand, I've seen churches where the couples are flirting with each other. Man, you know, I just, you want to see me hit the roof? You want to see me hit the roof? She's always like, honey, nobody wants me but you. I said, he was looking at you. 
kick his butt right now. I don't care if I'm a pastor. I'll kick his butt. Amen. My wife, excuse me, I said butt. Sorry. You kids don't say that. Your parents will spank you. I'll spank mine too. Makes me mad. It makes me angry. Amen. You live in a filthy world. You know what we don't want in this church? Filthiness. There ought to be purity here. There ought to be love here, godly love, like my sisters in Christ, like my brothers in Christ. It ought to be godly. It ought to be pure. It ought to be clean. It ought to be holy. It ought not be filthy. You want to rip my heart out? Let me find out about junk going on. Now rip yours out too, amen. <laughs> and that stuff happens in churches. And why are you preaching about that, preacher? You know of anything? I don't know of anything going on. Well, we got a bunch of kids we're raising up, and they're going to be teenagers. You got, we got some problems to face, don't we, people? We got some issues coming 10 years from now, don't we? Two brothers in Christ that will serve the Lord for years and let something happen and start blaming each other. And well, What are we going to do about it, preacher? We're going to set the standard now. We're going to set the standard now, and we're going to hold the standard by the grace and help of God. And it still doesn't guarantee all our kids are going to turn out right, but we better set a standard around here that's the right standard. Right now in those little kids. Look, don't make freaks out of them. Because if you bring too much stuff to their attention, they start thinking that way all the time, right? Are you with me, folks? You can create such a weird thing, a weird vibe, that it becomes uncomfortable and odd. I'm not talking about that. We're not going to start having women sit over here and men sit over there and all that goofy stuff. But let's make sure we're a pure people with a pure heart trying to serve God and keep it right. And we need God's help. I need God's help with that. And you do too. Why, preacher, are you struggling? Yeah, just as much as every one of you. Amen. Flesh is wicked. Let's move on to the next one so we can have a little more fun. The sons of God in verse number 2. The sons of God. First of all, I'm going to show you what most people, 90% of the churches in America actually higher than that, are going to teach you. And I've even listened to some men I highly respect and studied out what they had to say about it, and I couldn't, I, there just couldn't be more dead wrong in my, in my eyes. But I'm going to be fair, and I'm going to show you both sides of the argument, all right? And you make up your own mind. First of all, what they say is this. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that, were, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. They say the sons of God is a godly line. The godly line of Seth. So it would be like this side of the church, all these people had decided to serve the Lord and they trained their children right and they'd raise their children for God. This is the born again section of the church. This, nothing personal folks. <laughs> Pretend you're not here, all right? On this side of the church, you had all the folks that weren't saved and that raised their kids like the devil. Nothing personal, quit looking at me like that. Raised their kids like the devil, didn't care and they didn't, you know, they just, they just went crazy. They were party animals. They were ungodly and wicked. So this side of the church, these, these young men that were godly young men saw the ungodly women and said, oh, oh, man, she's beautiful, and they started intermarrying. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that that's a horrible thing, that you're not only to marry in the Lord. You're not to even date somebody that's not saved. Well, that's the whole point about dating, to find out whether or not that's the person God wants you to marry, right? And if they're not saved, you've got no business dating them. You're asking for a mess. But they say that the ungodly, the godly line saw the ungodly line and that they intermingled, and that's what the verse means. There are all kinds of problems with that. There are, there are tremendous amounts of problems with that viewpoint. But first, let me give you their proof texts. Go to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. I want to be fair. I mean, everybody has an argument for what they believe, right? If you don't look at the other argument and, and honestly think about it, then how can you really be sure that you got the right answer? Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? So let's be fair. Isaiah 43, look at verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. You say, what does that have to do with it? That's the same question I ask. I don't know, maybe you see it. I don't see it. But what they're saying there is that they're sons of God in the Old Testament. But to be honest with you, there isn't any sons of God in the Old Testament that are human. And I'll show you in a minute who the sons of God are. But from what I see, they're not there outside of this text. 
Who is this text talking about? Look at verse number 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O... Who's it speaking about? The nation of Israel. So when he comes down here to verse number 6, and he says, bring my sons from far, my daughters from the ends of the earth, he's talking about the nation of Israel being his sons and his daughters. It's, it's a national passage. So this isn't sons of God and, and men who are doing right. This is specifically to Israel, and it's, it's, it's clear. It's, and it says, my sons, bring them from far. So it's kind of stretching it to say that these are the sons of God. The sons of God are men. This is the only verse you've got. One or two other ones that are vague and in reference to Israel. Look at uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This one actually, in my mind, this does not prove the argument that the sons of God are actually human. This actually disproves the argument from what I see. But I want to show you what a son of God is. John chapter 1, verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. All right, who are the sons of God in John 1, 12? Who is it? Holler at me. It's a Wednesday night. I'm not even preaching. I'm teaching, so talk to me. People that received him. So before they received him, they weren't a son of God, right? After they received him, they became a son of God. Well, what happens to you in John chapter 3 when you receive him? You're born of what? The Spirit. You're born again. You know what happens when you get saved? You become a son of God. A son of God, and I'm going to show you the other text in a minute. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to look at some verses. A son of God is anybody that was directly, or any being that was directly created by God. When you were born, you were a product of procreation. I know God formed you and he knew you in the womb and all that stuff, but that was procreation. You were born of Adam. You had a sinful bloodline. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every person on this planet is born a sinner because mommy was a sinner and you run that all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Eve sinned. So you know what you are? You're a sinner. As a sinner, you deserve to go to hell. Christ came and lived the perfect life for you because you can't do it. He died on the cross to take away your sin, to pay your punishment. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says at that moment, you're born again. You're saved. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you've never been born again tonight, you are not a child of God. We're all God's children. What Bible verse did you get that from? That sounds sweet and pretty, but that is not Bible. We're brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man. Hogwash. You are not a child of God until you get saved. Once you get saved, you become a son of God. Praise the Lord for that. But in the Old Testament, they weren't even saved like we're saved. They didn't have the opportunity to be born again. God did give them some things that they had to do in order to make it, but they did not have the new birth of the Holy Spirit like you and I got. All right, back in Genesis chapter 6. Who are these sons of God? I'm sorry, let's go to Job. We didn't need to go to Genesis at all. Go to Job. Job chapter number 1. Look at verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. What? Wait a minute. The sons of God, the exact same phrase spelled the exact same way, came to present themselves before the Lord. You know what you've got there? Some supernatural beings because Satan shows up in the middle of them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So he's speaking to the sons of God as they come present themselves before the Lord. Satan comes among them and he's talking about men on the earth. There's a difference. Duh. All right, look at Job chapter 2. Job chapter number 2. Verse 1. 
Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. There it is again. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. The sons of God show up again. Look at Job 38. Job chapter number 38. Look at verse 7. Job 38, 7. Uh, let's back it up here for a minute. Look at, look at verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You see that? You know what the Lord's telling them? There was a time when all the sons of God were shouting for joy. Obviously, the logical conclusion is that some of them aren't at this point. But there was a time when they all were. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. That's Genesis 1-1. We already saw that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Excuse me, it's 1-2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's your cross-reference. So you know what those sons of God were? They're angels. They're some kind of angelic being. And they're back there worshiping God and praising God at one point. And then you see them later showing up to present themselves before the Lord and the devil comes among them. And it gets deeper than that, but I'm going to stop there for the sake of time. It gets real deep. Lord, show me some things this time through that I've never seen before, but I really don't want to get into it until I got it nailed down a little better. So you know what these guys do? These guys start looking at women. Back in Genesis 6. No, I'm sorry. Go to Psalm 82. Forgive me. I'm I'm a mess tonight. I did study, I promise. Psalm 82. Now watch this one. This is a great verse. This is a really powerful thing here. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. You see that small g? Now, hang on to that for a minute because we'll come back to it in a little bit. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? There's wicked people. Selah. So there's God standing in the congregation of the what? Mighty. You see the word mighty? Now, I'm going to show you how to study your own Bible without Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff, all right? Without a Strong's Concordance, you know, looking up the definitions. You can use one to find the reference. That's it. Other than that, I don't recommend them. I'm reading a book right now you don't want me to even start on. <sighs> the devil works in some amazing ways, folks. And, and Bible-believing churches all over have fallen for it. We'll go to it later, not tonight. He says, uh, uh, defend the poor and the fatherless, verse three to, 3, to do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Now watch. I have said, ye are gods. God's speaking to him saying, you're gods. Right? Small g. And all of you are children of the Most High. They were sons of who? Obviously. Watch. But ye shall die like what? How are you going to die like a man if you don't have flesh? God told them, you're gods. You are children of the Most High. But you boys are going to die. And fall like one of the prison princes. Now Genesis 6. I'm, I am ready this time. Genesis 6. Now God mentioned there the congregation of the mighty, right? Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in on the daughters of men, and they bare children unto, them, unto, children to them, the same became what? You see the word? I pointed out to you in the book of Psalms, when God was talking about gods and showed them being mighty. There's your cross-reference. It ties it all in together. And, and they were mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. It was like, whoa. 
You ever remember the children of Israel getting paranoid to go into a land where there was giants, scared to death of them, saying we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Israel not wanting to get out there to fight Goliath, and David comes along and takes him out. They were freaked out by these things, man. I mean, freaked out. They knew how powerful these things were. Now, here's an interesting take. We're not going to be too much longer. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Well, that's kind of true. Because she didn't die the day she ate it physically, but she did die spiritually, and eventually she died physically, right? So he spun it a little bit. He made a promise, so it wasn't really what he set it up for, but, you know, he could justify it. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? (laughs) Knowing good and evil. Wait a minute. Why did he tell her you're going to be as gods? She knew what they were. She'd seen them. They'd been around. I don't think, actually, I don't think they'd fallen yet. And I think he was saying you're going to be like them. You're going to be like them. Why would he have said you're going to be like them if they'd already fallen in their corrupt state? God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. Those sons of God are there in the garden with the Lord and they're watching the habitation of men and they're going, man, look at that. Man, they're beautiful. And they go down and they take on flesh. And Mr. Perfect rides in on his white horse, tells her about the fairyland down the road, the princess in her palace, and he's going to be her king and it's all going to be wonderful happily ever after. You want to know why some preachers say, no, that can't be it. That can't be it. It God would never let that happen. That just defies my imagination. Why would God, one of the arguments against this, is why would God allow devils that have so much more superior power to overpower women, right? Does that sound like, like really, that doesn't sound fair. Let's be fair. Think it through. Does that sound fair? In a sense, it doesn't. But have you ever noticed that God will give people what they want? Like the whole country throwing a fit about Obamacare? Yeah, what are you throwing a fit about? You voted him in. I know you didn't vote for him, but the whole country did. They wanted him in there, and he lied to us. You knew he was a liar for you voted him in. Give me that junk. You knew he lied about where he was born. You knew he lied about what he did. You knew he lied to the American people, telling them he was showing up when he wasn't even showing up to work. The the whole truth was there. People saw it. They didn't want it. They said, give us the liar. And now they got it. So, yeah, it ain't fair. He's more powerful than us, isn't he? He said, here's the law. Boom, you're living with it. Oh, that's not fair. God gives people what they want. And these people have already been wicked and sinning and running from God. So when those devils show up, the Bible says they took all of them which they chose. So the devil comes along and he picked the one he liked. And she fell for him. Isn't that scary? You want to know something about devils? They're, they're not, they don't have wings, folks. The winged devils in the Bible are female. And they're not devils. They're not angels, excuse me. You find some winged angels in the Bible, and they're female, and they're not formerly angels. They're not fallen angels. It's different. Stuff you see, just because you see an artist draw something with wings on it, doesn't make it an angel. Christmas season's coming. Oh, look at the angels. Those aren't angels, man. The angels don't have wings. They look like young men, and they're mighty, and they're beautiful, and they're powerful, and they're well-spoken. Satan had a silver tongue. The first thing he did is start saying, you, ye, what do you think? Oh, come on. It's not that bad. Look at it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And she said, oh, it is beautiful. It's going to make you wise. It's going to make you smart. It's all going to be perfect. Just go ahead. You're going to be better. And so she fell for it. She fell for his silver tongue. And these angels show up, and they're good looking, and they look just like men, and they're cohabitating with women. Because human with human does not produce giants. The giants show up right after that. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. In verse number 4, the giants show up, 
after verse number 2. Now, here's where your vampire stories come from. You ever notice those things got to suck blood to stay alive and to procreate? Because how is an angel that doesn't have any DNA going to procreate? I don't know. I'm just saying it's possible. I'm not preaching that these are vampires, all right? The pastor said vampires. Don't go home being crazy, all right? Seriously. But this is where they get their storylines from. It's possible. I'm just saying it's possible. Uh, Hollywood is way more inspired by the devil than people realize. And this stuff's going to happen again because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What were they doing? Marrying, giving in marriage. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They were drunk, they were marrying, and they were giving in marriage. You know what God said? Before they were married, they were having marital relationships. You know, you know, there's kids in here, but you know. And after they were married, they were giving themselves and their spouse in marriage. You know. Uh, it's kind of strange that even this stuff is going on in Baptist Bible-believing churches. Boils my blood. It boils my blood. Makes my hair stand on end. You know you're getting close to the coming of Jesus Christ. As God said, just like it was back then, it's going to be here. And there's a rise in supernatural occurrences. There's a rise in an infatuation with devils and with demonic spirits and you turn on your TV, and what do you get all kinds of? Halloween's bigger nowadays than Christmas. Adults dressing up. Weird stuff, man. You know what it is? It's wickedness. The closer God gets to coming back, the less of God's power you see in the world. It doesn't mean God's power lessens. The less of God's power you see in the world, and the more of the power of the devil you see in the world. And that's exactly where you're at. Aren't you encouraged? <laughs> Praise the Lord. This has been exciting tonight. Look at Jude chapter 6, and then we'll wrap it up. I mean, Jude chapter 6, and one other verse I want to show you. Jude, Jude chapter 6. I do that every time. Jude verse 6. There's only one chapter in Jude, for those of you that don't know why I'm losing it up here. Jude verse 6. Now watch it. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Now you're going to watch and see the context and what they were doing. But left their own habitation. Hath he reserved an everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day? Even as what? And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to what? And going after what? You know what those wicked men say on the construction crew? I need some what? Yeah, chasing somebody new, chasing somebody different, somebody that's not your spouse. You know what you just might be saying? I need a devil. Study your Bible. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Study your Bible. How much does God like an idolatry to fornication and wicked services and all kinds of stuff? Look at that thing is crazy, man. That'll creep you out, won't it? Um, by the way, I'm just going to stop there because, man, I'm going to start preaching. We'll be here all night, and I really want to stop now. By the way, just to mess with some of your head a little bit and help you out, because I'm like that. I want to be a blessing. I want to help you serve the Lord, and I mean that from my heart. I'm not preaching right now. I'm talking to you like we're sitting over my desk, and I'm your pastor. I want to help you serve the Lord and keep away from that filthy stuff. Now, I'm preaching again. Some of that stuff you're looking at, you might not be looking at something that's human. And that mind gets twisted and messed up and perverted and disgusting and it's not even real. So nothing real ever satisfies. Marriages get torn apart. Children get their heart ripped out by parents that are splitting up and they don't know what's going on and why. And there's a filthiness there. And there's an inability to connect in a personal, godly marriage. An inability to connect between you and your spouse can creep up. 
because you got your mind on so much filthiness and so much that you've seen out there that isn't even stinking reality. For all you know, you're comparing somebody that's real to something that's demonic. That is a devil. Jesus said one of you is a devil, didn't he? So ladies, quit getting all worked up like, I don't look like the women on TV. Well, great, just start saying it. Now it can become the family joke. You don't have to become a weirdo. The family joke can be, well, I don't look like a devil. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. You know what they were? They were obsessed. They were obsessed. Just like our culture. Obsessed with that stuff. Obsessed. You know, you got nowadays 14 and 15, 13 and 12 year old kids obsessed. They got a filthy mind like it used to be soldiers and jailbirds and, 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 and you know, military men and, and construction workers. The mind those guys used to have 20, 30, 40 years ago are 12, 13, 14, and 15 year old girls have today. And it makes me sick and it makes God sick. And it ought to make you sick. And it ought to make us go home and do a gut check and say, where am I at? Amen. So let me leave you with a little bit of hope before we go, okay? Look at verse 3. God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You know what blows my mind? In the face of the vilest culture, just like the one we're in, vile. I've seen a, a news clip from Detroit this week. Uh, I thought it was a woman until it started talking. Then I know that's a man. That's definitely a man. And then they said Rachel or something like that. I said, that's a woman. And it kind of did some hand gestures. And, mm, that's a woman. And then it talked to you. I said, mm, that's a man. And of course, they're going to interview that one and put him on. And you're crazy and intolerant if you say anything about it. Wicked, filthy, 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 wicked. God says, my spirit's not always going to strive. You know what? God's spirit is still striving with men today. He says, his days, yet his days shall be 120 years. God was saying, in 120 years, I'm going to drown him. A lot of preachers say that means God shortened the lifespan to 120 years. But this here, it's talking about God saying, I'm bringing the judgment in 120 years. I'm going to end him. So God gives him another 120 years. So there's a chance God could give us a little more time because he's so wonderful. His spirit's so great. I'm so thankful for the spirit of God, aren't you? He's a comforter. He's a guide. He's a friend. He teaches me and guides me into truth and he helps me produce things in my life I can't produce. He helps me control. I said all men are dogs earlier. Did I say that? Yeah, you know what he does? He helps me put the dog on a got the dog and so do you. The spirit of God puts him on a leash. It says don't ruin your life. Don't ruin your family. Don't, don't raise wicked kids. Don't, don't, go, don't go there. Don't snort that. Don't smoke that. Don't shoot that. Don't buy that. He puts me on a leash. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit of God. Don't you? He builds churches. He lets people get saved like that on Sunday. He gives us printing ministries to reach people. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit of God. He comforts my heart when I'm hurting. He guides me when I don't know where I'm going. He builds my marriage when I'd have messed it up. I'm glad it's God's Spirit, aren't you? Look at something else about the Lord and we're done. Verse 5. I'm sorry, not verse 5. Verse 6. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And notice this, it grieved him at his heart. <laughs> his heart was broken. God's got a good heart. I'm glad, although there's plenty of principalities and powers and devils out there and people out there that would love to ruin me. Just ruin me. I know it. <laughs> I've seen people before and thought, man, if that person could get away with it, they'd kill me. Just conv- I can read the eyes, you know, I'm just convinced of it. I'm glad, although there's all kinds of things that can hurt me and my family, God's got a great big old heart. It grieved him in his heart to see his sin. 
me ask you a question tonight. Are you grieving him? Or are you snuggling up close to him because he does love you? And in spite of all your sin, he still wants to draw you closer. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We're thankful for what a great heart you have, Lord. And we know how sinful we are. We know what a wicked culture we live in. And God, as time goes on, it's going to be more and more necessary for us to cling to you for safety, for purity, for strength. Now, Lord, I pray for a pure church here at Bible Believers Church of South Lyon. And Father, we know what we're up against. We know how wicked our flesh is. We humbly submit ourselves to God. I say it now, Lord humbly submit myself to you. I realize kind of an adversary I'm up against. Lord, just hitting me driving through the night there on Monday night and knowing that we had some equipment back there we wanted to print gospel tracts with and just realizing that we have a real enemy. And this passage of Scripture shows how he works and what he can do, how powerful he actually is. And Lord, we pray for your protection, for you to put a wall and a hedge about this church and the people in it. We pray for your blessing. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Help these services, Father, to be Holy Spirit-filled services. Help your people to decide to follow you and to walk in purity and holiness. And to seek the Lord. We love you. We thank you for how good you've been to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.